So good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Thursday night Anamkara meditation program. And with all my heart and with all my love, I welcome you to our program tonight. And thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. Uh, you're what this program is about because you bring the living presence of yourself, your divine self. And really, that's all there is. I mean, even the ordinary mind is a ray of that. So you're bringing the fullness of yourself and your dedication to practices, your intention to, to bring your highest nature into this wild and, <laughs> and crazy world. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you for coming, and thank you for doing practices in whatever ways that you engage them, uh, because we need as many people as possible walking that into the world. And that's really what Anamkara Meditation Foundation is about is supporting people in their meditation practices and making meditation freely available to everyone so that we can transform the world by transforming our state and then bringing that state of higher awareness, more open, loving compassion as our true nature into this world. So thank you for doing that and coming here this evening. Tonight is uh, a night when we focus on a kind of reading and contemplation uh, before we get into the meditative practices. But first we're going to start with the opening mantras. And they're a way of helping the mind to shift out of all the things it's been engaged in this day, this week, whatever it might be. The power of mantra is really the power of consciousness to transform the mind and transform in that way, our experience of who and what we are and how we view the world. So we start with these opening mantras and then sit for a few minutes just in the stillness afterwards because the fruit of mantra is that stillness, is the spaciousness of awareness, the spaciousness of simply being, being present here and now. That's what unfolds as mantra, in a sense, does its work uh, to help absorb the mind in its source. Mantra arises from the source, and so when we engage it and, and really become absorbed in it, we can descend back into that pure spaciousness of being and the boundless qualities of love, compassion, kindness, and joy that, that are the irreducible qualities of what our highest nature is. So we start with these opening mantras. Shrimate Kali Devi Ki Jai Sevitam Kapita Jambu Palachar Bakshanam Kumasutam Shokam Vinashakaratam Namami Vigneshwara Parapankajam Shri Ganeshaya Namaha Shri Ganeshaya Namaha Shri Ganeshaya Namaha Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamunda Chate Purnasya Purnamandaya Purnamevavashishate Om Shanti 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 Shri Matakali
So once again, with all my heart, I welcome you to our program this evening. So good of you to join us and be able to participate and lend the power of your presence, the power of your practices uh, to our gathering, this satsang this evening. So this is an evening uh, as the second of the month that we usually do a kind of reading and contemplation as part of our practices. And tonight I wanted to read uh, a section on, on the Buddhist practice of mindfulness. You know, a lot is written about mindfulness. Uh, and in the West, it's uh, become something that's taught in every kind of business and sports facilities and all kinds of things are doing mindfulness. But I thought it would be good to go back to what Buddha talked about as mindfulness and get back to the root of what mindfulness is. And this is uh, really from Buddha's writings, and it's called the Satipana uh, Sutta. And it was translated by the great Buddhist master Thich Nhat Hanh. And it comes from a book. It's actually a collection. It's a great collection to have in your library, uh, Teachings of the Buddha, and selected and edited by uh, Jack Cornfield, a wonderful current Buddhist teacher. Um, I haven't seen him in a number of years, but he's a, he's a great man and, and a very good teacher. So um, I highly recommend this. So when we talk about mindfulness, you know, especially in challenging times, uh, mindfulness is a foundational practice. And so it's something that really helps us to steady ourselves. Uh, so much of what is stirring the mind these days, we can actually train the mind to be more resilient, uh, more detached and centered and present. And that gives us the steadiness and the strength in order to deal with whatever is going on. So just as, you know, at, at other kinds of turbulent times, we want to come back to the foundational practices that really calm and steady us. So we'll be talking about mindfulness, and then later we'll be doing um, the really root practice of chant of, of mantra and the use of mantra for going into meditation. But mindfulness is good because it's something that starts with engaging the mind. And that's typically where our consciousness is. It's full of this thought, that feeling, this reaction, and the latest news item we heard, the latest thing that happened in, in work, a relationship, whatever it might be. These are all impacting the mind. And when they impact the mind, they, they stir the mind. So starting off with a practice like mindfulness and a practice that we can do both as a sitting practice, but also as an integrative practice through the day by calling on this quality of attention. Because attention is really what mindfulness is working with. And our attention habitually goes after whatever is kind of stirring the mind or has the most energy in the mind in the moment. So mindfulness is a way of cultivating this calm, steady awareness that can also look at the mind, be the observer of the mind. And in part, it's training the mind to step back and observe itself. Okay? And that helps it to become calmer, more steady, uh, and just be present with what's there without being identified with it. Mm -hmm. That's one of the key elements when we're working with awareness and attention is to disidentify from the reactivity that so grabs all of our attention and gets us caught up in the drama of the mind, the drama of the world. So this is Buddha speaking. He says, O oh monks, said the Buddha, there is a most wonderful way to help living beings realize purification, to overcome directly grief and sorrow, put an end to pain and anxiety, to travel the right path and realize the highest, nirvana. This way is the four establishments of mindfulness. Buddha goes on and says, what are the four establishments? Monks, a practitioner remains established in the observation of the body in the body, diligent with a clear understanding, mindful, having abandoned every craving and every distaste for life. So that theme that's going to come up repeatedly, cravings and distaste, uh, 
Buddha was a practitioner of yoga, and in the Yoga Sutras will talk about going beyond attraction and aversion. That's what that thing, because so much of what drives the mind is what's attractive here, what's aversive, and it goes back and forth between those poles. So how do we calm it so it's not driven by attraction and not driven by aversion? So Buddha says, one remains established in the observation of the feelings, in the feelings, diligent and with clear understanding, mindful, having abandoned craving and every distaste for this life. So he's going to go through. He's going through, first you're observing just mind and content of mind, but then you can also observe and just watch the feelings. Hmm? One remains established in the observation of mind in the mind, diligent with clear understanding, mindful, having abandoned every craving and every distaste for this life. Sometimes it feels a little confusing for people when he says the observation of the mind in the mind. Well, understand the observation of the mind in this way, especially through words, is the mind itself. It's as if there's a calmer part of the mind looking at the more agitated part of mind and saying, oh, look at that. In the yogic tradition, there would be spoken of as the different gunas, the qualities of awareness. And sattva guna, the balanced kind of quality is what observes raja and, and tamaguna, either agitation or being torporous. This is a similar kind of way that then Buddha is talking, um, and it would be familiar, especially at his time, because of the Yoga Sutras, and um, that was part of the cultural context that he was teaching in. He goes on to say, one remains established in the observation of the objects of mind, in the objects of mind, diligent with clear understanding, mindful, having abandoned every craving and every distaste for this life. So the objects of mind. Remember what we chant at the end of the month when we chant the Heart Sutra. And in the Heart Sutra, Buddha is going into that state of samadhi and describing those objects of mind there he calls them the five skandhas, the aggregates. These are the things that all appear within that limited consciousness that we call mind. So all these are dynamics for helping us step back from the mind. It's, it's the remedy for being too caught, too identified, being in the swirl of what the mind is. Oh, let me observe the thoughts. Let me observe feelings. Let me observe sensations. Let me observe the mind itself. The observer is getting further and further uh, into a state of freedom from the mind. Buddha then goes on to say, and how does a practitioner remain established in the observation of the body in the body? He says, one goes to the forest, to the foot of a tree, or into an empty room, sits down cross-legged in the lotus position, holds one body straight, and establishes mindfulness. Breathing in, one is aware of breathing in. Breathing out, one is aware of breathing out. Breathing in a long breath, one knows, I am breathing in a long breath. Breathing out a long breath, one knows, I am breathing out a long breath. Breathing in a short breath, one knows, I am breathing in a short breath. Breathing out a short breath, one knows I am breathing out a short breath. So you're just watching and just describing. The breath is coming in, the breath is going out. A long breath went out, a long breath came in. As you're doing that, more and more, you're becoming more and more the detached observer. Not caught in the breath, not caught in the mind observing the breath. Detached and aware relaxed and at ease, more and more you become steady. The steadiness is a root quality of your highest nature. It's one of the, uh, the four immeasurables that Buddha talked about, is, is unshakable, boundless equanimity. And so these are practices that help us regain access to that. Buddha goes on to say, moreover, when walking, the practitioner is aware, I am walking. When standing, is aware, I am standing. 
when sitting is aware I am sitting when lying down is aware I am lying down in whatever position one's body happens to be one is aware of the position of the body when one is going forward or backward, one applies full awareness to one's going forward or backward. When one looks in front or looks behind, bends down or stands up, one also applies full awareness to what one is doing. One applies full awareness to wearing the robe or carrying an alms bowl. When one eats or drinks, chews or savors the food, one applies full awareness to all this. When passing excrement or urinating, one applies full awareness to this. When one walks, stands, lies down, sits, sleeps, wakes up, speaks, or is silent, one shines his awareness on all this. So you see, mindfulness is not a practice that's limited to, oh, I just sit in a lotus posture, or I just do a walking meditation. Mindfulness is a quality of awareness that is present all the time. In a sense, you're accessing the presence of Buddha mind, your wakefulness. Buddha means awake. What is it awake? It's awake and aware. What's it aware of? What is happening in that moment? The body is sitting. The body is speaking. The hand is moving. The eyes are seeing. The ears are hearing. Awareness is illuminating that, observing that, seeing that. When we become aware of awareness, observing, we're stepping back from being caught in the content of awareness. That is the f a fundamental aspect of what meditation empowers us to do. We spend most of our lives completely engaged in content of awareness and pay little or no attention to awareness itself. So the meditation practice is going, oh, but that's the secret. Get a hold of awareness and follow that and you come to the boundless presence that is aware and holds the universe in its awareness. Hmm? That's where this is going. Monks, how does a practitioner remain established in the observation of the feelings in the feelings? Buddha said, whenever the practitioner has a pleasant feeling, one is aware, I am experiencing a pleasant feeling. Whenever one has a painful feeling, one is aware, I am experiencing a painful feeling. Whenever one experiences a feeling which is neither pleasant nor painful, one is aware. I am experiencing a neutral feeling. When one experiences a feeling based in the body, one is aware. I am experiencing a feeling based in the body. When one experiences a feeling based in the mind, one is aware. I am experiencing a feeling based in the mind. Awareness, awareness, awareness as an observer. When we see ourselves as that observer, we're becoming more detached from all that swirling content of mind. It could be a big feeling, a little feeling, a high energy feeling, a low energy feeling. It doesn't matter. The observer is unmoved by movements of the mind. Hmm? The observer is free. The observer is unmoved by the movements of the mind. That's why we can talk about a sort of a spaciousness of awareness, a field of awareness, or the sky of awareness. In the sky, all kinds of things move through the sky. Is the sky shaken? No, you can fly a 747 through the sky. The sky is unmoved. The spaciousness of awareness, the spaciousness of being, holds all without being agitated without being moved by the movements of the content within it. Monks, how does the practitioner remain established in the observation of the mind in the mind? When one's mind is desiring, the practitioner is aware, my mind is desiring. When one's mind is not desiring, one is aware, my mind is not desiring. When one's mind is hating something, one is aware, my mind is hating something. When a mind is not hating, one is aware. My mind is not hating. When one's mind is in a state of ignorance, one is aware. My mind is in a state of ignorance. When one's mind is not in a state of ignorance, one is aware. My mind is not in a state of ignorance. 
When one's mind is tense, one is aware. My mind is tense. When one's mind is not tense, one is aware. My mind is not tense. When one's mind is distracted, one is aware. My mind is distracted. And when one's mind is not distracted, one is aware. My mind is not distracted. When one's mind has a wider scope, one is aware. My mind has a wider scope. When one's mind has a narrow scope, one is aware. My mind has become narrow in scope. So when one's mind is composed, one is aware. My mind is composed. When one's mind is not composed, one is aware. My mind is not composed. When one's mind is free, one is aware. My mind is free. When one's mind is not free, one is aware. My mind is not free. Underlying this is the understanding. It's awareness illuminating the state of mind. You are not the mind. You are not that state of mind. Awareness, this awakened field of awareness, is unmoved by the states and qualities of mind. The states and quality of mind, they condition our experience of the world. So the more we can free the mind of those conditioned patterns, the more we can be present and awake and experience the world in that wakeful, open spaciousness, that field of self-luminous awareness. Monks, how does a practitioner remain established in the observations of objects in the mind in, as the mind? Well, first of all, one observes the objects of mind in the objects of mind with regard to the five hindrances. How does one observe this? So Buddha's going to talk about the five hindrances, things that get in the way of the mind, especially uh, the kind of reactivity of the mind. So the first one has to do with uh, sensual pleasure desires. That's, that's that very attractive qualities that the mind can be seeking. So Buddha says, when sensual desire is present in oneself, one is aware sensual desire is present in me. Or when sensual desire is not present in oneself, one is aware sensual desire is not present in me. When sensual desire begins to arise, one is aware of it. When already arisen, sensual desire is abandoned, and one is aware of it. When sensual desire already abandoned will not rise again in the future, one is aware of that. Pure awareness, simple awareness. There's no judgment. There's no, oh, what's wrong with me for having that experience? You're simply, it's a, just another type of content showing up in the light of awareness. And you're just simply awake, aware, noticing it. Whether it's there, whether it's arising, whether it's disappeared, whether it's gone, whether it's failed to arise, you're simply aware. It's free of judgment. It's free of pushing away or clinging to. It's free of open, spacious awareness. That is the foundation of who and what we are. Buddha goes on, when anger is present in oneself, one is aware, anger is present in me. When anger is not present in oneself, one is aware, anger is not present in me. When anger begins to arise, one is aware. When already arisen, anger is abandoned, one is aware of that. When anger already abandoned will not rise again in the future, one is aware of that. Simple awareness. Simple awareness. Now there are other practices at other times that we do to cultivate freedom from anger, freedom from the, the five hindrances. But in mindfulness, you're simply observing. And by observing, you're setting yourself free. You're the observer, not the content. You're the seer, not the seen. Who's the seer? Well, in the yoga tradition, that's Shiva, that's Shakti. That's the observer. That's the nature of that. Buddha goes on, when dullness or drowsiness are present in oneself, one is aware. Dullness and drowsiness are present in me. When dullness and drowsiness, drowsiness are not present in oneself, one is aware. Dullness and drowsiness are not present in me. When dullness and drowsiness begin to arise, one is aware of it. 
when already risen. Dullness and drowsiness are abandoned, and one is aware of that. When dullness and drowsiness already abandoned will not arise again in the future, one is aware of that. So no matter what the condition of dullness and drowsiness, you're simply aware of it. You're simply aware. When agitation and remorse are present in oneself, one is aware. Agitation and remorse are present in me. When agitation and remorse are not present in oneself, one is aware. Agitation and remorse are not present in me. When agitation and remorse begin to arise, one is aware of it. When already arisen, agitation and remorse are let go of, abandoned, and one is aware of that. When agitation and remorse are already abandoned and they will not arise again, well, one is aware of that. When doubt is present in oneself, one is aware. Doubt is present in me. When doubt is not present in oneself, one is aware. Doubt is not present in me. When doubt begins to arise, one is aware of it. When already arisen, doubt is abandoned, one is aware of it. When doubt already abandoned does not rise again in the future, one is aware of that. This is how the practitioner remains established in the observation of the objects of mind in the objects of mind. Observation of the objects of mind from inside the objects of mind or outside the objects of mind. Or observation of objects of mind both inside and outside, just observing. One remains established in the observation of the process of coming to be in the objects of mind or the process of dissolution in the objects of mind or both in the process of coming to be and the dissolution. Or one is mindful of the fact there is an object of mind here until understanding and full awareness come about. One remains established in observation, free not caught up in any worldly consideration. That is how to practice observation of the objects of mind and the objects of mind with regard to the five hindrances, O monks. So you can see the entire practice of mindfulness has to do with this very present observation, whatever it might be, wherever we might be, doing whatever we might be. Yeah? It's any time that we can be observing, um, and that quality of observation is what will then help us step back from being completely identified and caught up in whatever that content may be, pleasant or unpleasant, pleasurable or unpleasurable. Because the mind is going back and forth between those poles. The observer is just watching and inviting the mind Inviting the mind to get free of that ping-pong game with itself, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, uses up so much energy, makes us so weary. Mm? That, that very process of getting caught up um, is further agitates the mind, further exhausts the mind, creates further pain and suffering. So Buddha's teachings were all about getting free of suffering. And the root of that is stepping back from the mind because that's what generates the suffering. The observer, that witness, that consciousness that's boundless and all-embracing has certain root qualities to it. The boundlessness of wisdom, uh, the boundlessness of love, the boundlessness of equanimity, the boundlessness of joy. Those are the root qualities of that awareness. So when Buddha talked about nirvana, nirvana means extinguished. What was he talking about extinguishing? The cravings and agitations of the mind. So then we can just rest in our wakefulness, in our Buddha nature, in its boundlessness. And so drawing on those practices, uh, whether it's a calm time or not, uh, certainly in tumultuous times, these are very steadying practices. Oh, I can observe that. I can see that. I can, I can observe the mind and step back. And that helps to invite the mind also to let go. The mind begins to, uh, to follow more and more awareness rather than demanding attention follow it. 
most of the time, our attention is following and running after whatever the mind is doing. When we start to separate it from the mind and see the, the boundlessness of that equanimity, the boundlessness of the joy, uh, just, the, just even the peacefulness and steadiness of awareness, then the mind starts to go, oh, wait a minute. See, for the mind, that too is attractive. But at least it's being attracted to something that's going to help it get free. Rather than being attracted to something outside that's just going to lead to further suffering and agitation at some point. So turning within to the boundlessness of awareness, the mind itself can come to rest in a whole other way. Not the rest that's momentary because it satisfied a desire or got free of something it wanted to avoid and then is off onto the next thing that's going to create agitation. No, this is coming to rest in the very ground of rest, hmm? the very source of that sense of equanimity, peace, unshakable presence. That's where we want to come to rest. So the mind gets to open that and go into that. So mindfulness is that kind of practice. Uh, Do any time, any place, coming back to the observer, coming back to the witness. Uh, And certainly in the the Shaivite Shakti traditions, we talk about Shiva consciousness as that observer. Shiva means the auspicious one. It's the same as our Buddha nature, the one who is free awake and aware at all times, in all places. Now, what is it aware of? That all this is its own self. All this is the creation of its own power, the unfolding of its own being. Awake and aware. Aware of the boundless love that holds all that. Holds it all as its own self. So we make use of mantra, which is not mind-born. Mantra is a throb, a pulsation of that infinite consciousness. So when we make use of mantra, an awakened mantra, empowered mantra, like the mantra Om Namah Shivaya that we're going to be chanting in a few moments, Om Namah Shivaya means I, I bow to the auspicious one. But more than the meaning, it is a throb of the auspicious one itself. It's, the, it's called the sound form of the infinite, the sound form of the divine. Uh, and so when we become absorbed in that sound form through chanting and then through this the silent repetition over and over in our consciousness of Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, we start off on that kind of more superficial level of where the mind is, uh, But if we really become absorbed in the mantra, we can find it descending. Um, And it's not really descending in a sense, that's the experience of the mind. Mantra permeates all levels of being. But as the mind quiets, it becomes more subtle. As it becomes more subtle, it can become more aware of subtle qualities and energies of the mantra. As it becomes more absorbed in that, it can begin to experience what the mantra is even as it sheds the form of the sound syllables, Om Namah Shivaya. Because after a while, the repetition of mantra is really the throb of simple awareness of being. The mantra begins to shed its form and what's left is just the spaciousness of being. That spaciousness of being The awareness of that, that too is mantra. That too is a throb of the infinite. That's where mantra arises from. That's why people often, when they go deep into meditation, can hear the spontaneous arising of mantra. And these these subtle sounds that aren't made uh, by any physical means. So they're called nada these divine sounds that emanate uh, as we become more and more subtle. So mantra sounds like words, sounds and has a a meaning that could be translated, at least some of the mantras, uh, 
the Maha Mantra, the Great Mantra Om Namah Shivaya does. I honor, I bow to the auspicious one, my own self, the divine within, within everything and everyone. But it's that pulsation of the infinite that's really uh, the root of mantra. So going into mantra, becoming absorbed in that sound through chant and then through silent repetition, until that's all there is. And any thought arises, we just offer it back, let it dissolve in Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. With the awareness of I am that. I am that throb of mantra. I am that pulsation of consciousness that has taken that form. I am the boundless one. Shiva hum, Shiva hum. I am Shiva, I am Shiva. That's the root awareness of mantra. And that's what it as a vehicle serves to bring us back to. That pure knowing of our infinitude, of our boundlessness. So we've, we've known for so many lifetimes our finite nature and what it is to be bound by the mind. Now the practices open the door to what's already present, the fullness of being, the boundlessness and spaciousness of loving awareness. That's the root of mantra. That's who you are. That experience is the experience of I am that. Hum sa. I am that. So we're going to be chanting the mantra Om Namah Shivaya now for a few minutes. Uh, and it's a slow chant. And the chant also has uh, a way of regulating our breath. Uh, you know, in the yoga tradition, regulation of breath is another way that we help to calm the mind. And when you're chanting, it's regulating the breath. We even actually have research, uh, scientific research, showing the impact of these kinds of practices and as they slow and deepen the breath, how they alter our physiology and our neurophysiology. Because you start out with an inhalation and then as you're exhaling, you're chanting the Om and then you're inhaling and the Nama and then inhaling and chanting the Shivaya. And so there's this there's this wonderful uh, waves of the breath coming in and going out. Coming in silently, going out with the sound Om. Coming in silently, going out with Nama. Coming in silently, going out with Shivaya. And then the silence, it just continues like that. And so that play of the flow of the breath coming in and going out is also helping to quiet the body quiet the mind, stabilize our consciousness, give it a steadiness, and wash through our subtle body and our physical body, uh, the prana that then helps to clear out the agitation that's been there. So we'll chant for a few minutes and then just sit in the stillness. And in the stillness, continue the silent repetition of the mantra until it becomes quiet on its own. And if you wind up in that space of absolute stillness, just rest there. Just rest there. If the mind moves again, then you can give it the mantra, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, until it absorbs all movements of the mind again, and you rest in the stillness, the stillness of presence, the stillness of the infinite, the stillness of your own divine self. Shri Matakali Mahadevi Ki Jai Oh, 
Consciousness, consciousness that sees without being seen, the observer. When we turn our attention to the observer, we can dissolve into the infinite, the source of mantra, the source of mind itself. For that reason, in the ancient Shiva Sutras, it says, Chittam Mantraha, the mind is mantra. The mind is a throb of that same shakti, that power of consciousness that takes the form of mantra. So dissolving the mind in mantra is dissolving it in its source. So we come back home to our free, true, open, expansive nature of being so that we're empowered to have the resilience and the strength to bring what our heart knows is the truth of who we are, that love, that compassion, that wisdom, that presence, that patience, and that kindness, to bring that into the moment. So the practices empower us to be true to ourself. And in being true to ourself, we walk that truth into the world. And then we help to transform the world. So I want to thank you all again for coming this evening. And bring the power of your practices, the power of your intention, the power of your presence. You know, regardless of what the quality of mind is, the state of the mind, regardless of what the, the state of the body is, your infinite divine self is unsullied, untarnished, unchanged, always present. So come home to that. Come home to that and bring that into the world. So thank you for coming this evening. Thank you for doing the practices. Thank you for being you. And thank you also for all the ways that you support Anamkara and through donations, through sharing our e-newsletter and the YouTube channel of these videos uh, so that we can fulfill our mission of reaching as many people to just freely offer practices of meditation practices that bring us home to the truth of who we are and bring that more and more into the world. Well, thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm.